What's up, everybody? It's Lexi D here. Welcome back to Something to Consider. In this episode, we're going to talk about the need to be vigilant around protecting your peace. And I chose vigilant, I chose that word specifically because I feel like it really emphasizes what takes place when someone prioritizes peace in their life. And I think the way in which this looks, how it looks to be vigilant with prioritizing your peace is through the standards and the boundaries that you uphold. We hear a lot lately about quiet quitting. And I don't really like the term just because of the connotation that is associated to it, where it sounds like people are now slacking off and they're now just doing the bare minimum of their jobs, when really what I think is happening is that people are now burnt out from from hustle culture and they no longer and they no longer want to have that mindset. At the start of the pandemic, we were hearing a lot of messaging like, if you don't come out of this pandemic having built a business, then what are you really doing? Then you're being lazy. Then you're not optimizing your time. Oh, because prioritizing mental health or just prioritizing a state of a state of peace so that I'm not overwhelmed, that's not enough. I need to now deal with all of that and also build a business on top of it. Now, this is not to discredit the individuals who were able to build something as a part of this pandemic, who were able to cultivate something. But at the same time, those kinds of statements dismiss the reality of others where our mental health has taken a toll from being in isolation, from not being able to physically hug anybody. Do y'all remember that? At one point, people were afraid to hug each other. Like, that is something I, as a side note, I remember when I was in high school and I would be leaving from my calculus class and I was completely stressed out And I was going to my history class and one of my close friends at the time, she would just see how stressed out I was. And every time she would just give me a hug and it would make me feel so much better. Nothing else was happening. Like the problem was still there. The the worry was still there. But for that moment, it helped to calm and ease my nervous system. So we were at a period in time in which people weren't even hugging where we're in a world where I think we already lack or are deprived of having affection. And affection has become coded as this sexual thing, but it's not, affection is not sexual in and of itself. It can be, but I do think that there are very real needs around affection that don't get talked about, that have become heightened in the wake of the pandemic when we were told to stay away from each other. I think even the introverts (laughs) were struggling at one point, like, yo, I like my alone time and my solitude, but I mean, I wanna have the option. And when we were told we we didn't even have the option to be with people outside of our household, it was just things were going crazy. And so one of the things that has come up for me when I think about what has happened throughout the pandemic and how it has played a role in really deprecating our mental health. And then now hearing about quiet quitting is the importance of prioritizing our peace and what that has looked like. Because I've heard this statement before. I've heard that peace above everything is, is the goal, but what does that look like? So this is what it has looked like in my life. It has looked like boundaries and standards. Let's talk about work for a minute. When I first started working my big girl full-time job, I wasn't that ecstatic about (laughs) the particular job I was at. I was happy to make the money I was making. That is the reason why I got into, that is the reason why I, I got into the field that I did and got the degree that I did was because I knew that it would come with financial stability 
in the in in the sense of having job stability and plentiful job opportunities. So I achieved that goal. And yet at the same time, I found that I was quite uneasy. I was quite unhappy. And I the way that I kind of would maneuver, the way that I chose to maneuver through that was to really focus my time when I was at work on work. But when I left the office, I wasn't talking about work. I wasn't talking about work. I was so vigilant about this <laughs> to the point where if someone would ask me about work, my response nine times out of 10 to them was, am I on the clock? Am I at work? No, then we're not talking about work. We're going to talk about something else. I wanted that to be as small of a part of my life as possible. And in some ways, people could look at that and say, ugh, that's not really the best route, especially when you're first starting off in your career. You want to be able to do more and to network and connect. And this is what I've learned, especially as I've heard about this whole quiet quitting. It is not necessarily, for me in my experience, let me say it this way, because I can't speak for everyone everyone else's experience, of course. But in my experience, the more that I push myself, the more that I tire myself, the more that I stress myself out, I don't get more accolades as a part of that. The more that I do that, the more stressed I, I become, and I don't even get the the rewards that come with that kind of way of working. In fact, here's a better way to say it. The less that I do that, the more accolades I get. (laughs) And I think it's because what's happening is when I'm not so stressed out, I'm able to show up in spaces, not just at work, but in areas, in all areas of my life, present, happy, joyful and who doesn't want to be in the space of someone who's present happy and joyful would you rather be with someone like that or someone who's stressed out who's not even with you in that moment because their their mind is on the next thing how many times have we been in meetings where someone's not listening they're multitasking (laughs) right i mean that can beg the question of why they're in the meeting at all but as someone who most of my meetings that i'm in i'm the one who organizes it I do my best to be mindful of who is in that meeting. Do they absolutely need to be there? And being very much aware of, is this person required or or are they optional? (laughs) And if someone is optional, usually I treat that as this person may want to join this, but I'm not going to schedule around them. This is really just to make them aware that this meeting is happening. And yet what I've noticed sometimes is I'll be in those meetings, you ask somebody a question and it's, oh, what was that? I didn't hear that. Like, come on, come on. So what would you rather be with someone who can't be present? And I realize that sometimes this is not necessarily our own doing. Some of this is out of our control in terms of if someone has expectations, too high of expectations of you or your workload is just crazy and your manager is not working to shift and change that, well, then of course, it's it's going to have an impact on how you show up in these spaces. But in as much as we can control, being able to establish boundaries at work so that I can show up in these spaces present is beneficial for everyone. How does it benefit anyone to show up half there? Then we have to have another meeting to finish the other half. It it slows everything down. And so when I was first starting out in my career and I had those very strict boundaries around my personal time being my personal time, I found that it helped me to lessen the amount of stress in my life. And so when I think of the term quiet quitting now, I think of boundaries. Now this might be, for some people, it very well could be they are doing bare minimum or less than the bare minimum and they're just kind of floating on by. 
And it is my opinion that it is up to management and supervisors to have a process in place in which you will be aware of that. And I'm not talking about micromanaging. I'm not talking about watching this person all the time because at that point you might as well do the job yourself. As a side note, when it comes to micromanaging, my thought process on on it is if someone feels the need to micromanage, do the job yourself. Why are you paying me to sit up here and just pick apart my work? Do do it yourself, right? Like that's what this whole thing is for. Of If you are a manager, you are to be delegating work. And if you feel the need to micromanage, it is likely because you don't really know how to delegate work. That is definitely a skill set that needs to be fostered. But if it's not fostered and you try to overcompensate by micromanaging, you might as well just do the work yourself. So having those boundaries, having boundaries at work enables us to show up as our best selves and ultimately helps everyone around us. And and boundaries and what that can look like is not going past, not working well into the evenings and not going past certain parameters that you have set for yourself. I know for me, I had to delete email off of my phone because I found myself, as soon as I woke up, I was looking at my email. I am not in a mission critical role that requires me to, as soon as I wake up, to look at my email. I'm not. If I get an email nine times out of 10, it can wait for a response for like two to three hours. It's nothing super urgent. And even if it is more urgent than my organization, we use an instant messaging service. And even with that though, like it's, it's still, there still are ways that I've learned that I can manage someone's expectations around that. So things like if I do check Slack first thing in the morning and respond right away, people are going to start expecting that. And this is where the implementations, the implementation of boundaries come into play. I don't necessarily have to communicate to someone after a certain time in the day, I won't be available. I just won't be available. (laughs) Meaning they can message me all they want. They can email me. They can call me all they want. But if I don't answer the phone after a certain time, you're going to start registering. Oh, she's not available (laughs) at this time. If I want to reach her, let me try to contact her earlier in the day. Let me try to schedule some time with her so I can know if she will be available. Because I think part of the challenge with setting boundaries is how to do it in a way that is effective, but also doesn't come across aggressive. And this can be a challenge especially when we haven't done it before. And so what I've learned that works beautifully is establishing your boundaries with someone through your actions in the ways that I just described. Now, it also can be a nice added touch to, in addition to that, if you're noticing that someone continues to message you or whatever the case may be after a certain time, depending on the dynamic, you could also consider sharing with that person or those individuals, hey, as you've probably noticed, I'm unavailable at this time. So if you would like to reach me, please make sure to schedule some time with me or to contact me between the hours of 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., whatever your hours are. And so this setting, this way of setting boundaries, I think helps to overcome some of that anxiety around how someone may respond. Now, let me say this, how someone responds is up to them and that's their responsibility. The only responsibility that we have is to establish what we see as what we need. We are, we are responsible for setting our boundaries, for establishing what those look like so that we can be our best selves 
No one else is responsible for that. Just like we are not responsible for setting how this person responds. Hopefully that makes sense. The other arena in which this has shown up in my life is in romantic settings where I have found myself not listening to my needs, not listening to my wants, and really just struggling with that whole dynamic or that whole, what is it called? Just the whole way of, again, going back to the way of communicating boundaries in these settings. And it's the same thing as in work. I think it comes down to actions. So for me, what I've learned is, hey, if if someone's not reaching out to me, this is generic, what I'm saying, right? Everything I think is situational. But in general, if I'm getting to know someone and they just stop reaching out, it's probably just going to die on the vine. (laughs) I'm not coming after anybody or trying to figure something out or any of that. We are all responsible for ourselves and how we move in this world. And so if if someone is messaging with me and they just fall off, There could be, it could be for a number of reasons, but my assumption is going to be that if this person wants to get back in contact with me, they will. Whereas before, what it would be is, ooh, let me craft out a message that could maybe elicit a response from this person. Or maybe let me just go for the jugular. Why haven't you messaged me? None of that feels good to do. And it also doesn't feel good to receive. If we think about what it feels like for someone to challenge us in that way and say, why haven't you called me? Or why haven't, do you want to really deal with that? And this is, this is not to be confused with not being accountable for your actions. Because if someone just completely falls off and doesn't say anything about it, what I do is I'm, I'm observing it. And if you do show up again, that could be an opportunity for me to say something like, hey, I noticed that there's been a drop in communication. I'm curious what's going on there. That's a different energy entirely than where have you been at? Why haven't you reached out to me? You see, you see the difference there? It, it's slight, but it, it is huge in impact. And in learning to communicate my boundaries in the, in this way, and in learning to be curious instead of being judgmental, this is what I strive for y'all. I am not perfect, but in learning these things, it has enabled me to have so much more peace in my life. Boundaries are about understanding where you end and someone else begins. It is allowing for that space in between you all for each of you to decide if you want to step in it or if you want to step away from it. And that is an ongoing thing. As we age or as we go into different phases in our life, our boundaries may change as they should because we're learning more about ourselves and what we need. Something else for me as I've grown older is that I value privacy a lot more. I don't share every single thing with everyone. Not that I did that before, but where I've really noticed this is in my standards. I used to be quite transparent with people, with even close one, close, let me be precise about this. I used to be a lot more transparent with the people around me, with my close friends friends and family about my standards. And I think as a rule of thumb, it is good to be transparent. I've talked about vulnerability and I I value it and I need it. But I've also learned that there are levels to it and not everybody needs to know every single level. 
this has come up a lot for me in standards in dating because what I re- recognized and realized is that if I share my standards with the wrong person, then I end up with someone trying to challenge me. And some of my standards, they're just not up for debate. They're not up for discussion. And I am not in a space where I want to defend myself. So I like to take the preventative route wherever I can. I may test a little bit and share something, share maybe something small and see how that person responds. And then if they don't respond favorably in the way that I would like, I don't share certain things with them anymore. And maybe that sucks in some ways to not be able to share everything with those closest to you. But I've also found that it helps to preserve that relationship and keep peace in my life. All of these things are about how to be vigilant about protecting my peace. It is my responsibility. And so these are the things that I choose to do as ways to cultivate and to protect my peace. So some things to consider when it comes to you being vigilant about your peace is what are the boundaries that you feel like you need to have in place to keep you in a peaceful space? How do you feel like you can use your actions to communicate those boundaries? And if necessary, How do you feel like you can use your words to communicate those boundaries as well? So with that, I want to thank you all for listening and I'll talk to you in my next one.